let me walk you through what we're going to cover today for Citrix networking for Zen App and Zen Desktop administrators. First, I'm going to run through a lot of details with regard to the ICA protocols and things that, things that you need to know as Citrix admins to have that conversation with your network administrators. And then the second half of the session, we're going to go through why is my Citrix session so slow? Because I know you've never heard that from any of your users. Never. That's what I thought. So, you know, we might just have a half a session and that's it. All right. My name is Joe Harder. I am a uh, senior network architect at CompuShare, which is a service provider. I spent 11 years with Citrix as a senior architect, then I did some consulting for a while, and now I'm with CompuShare. So I, a lot of these things that you're going to see, so the case examples that we're going to go through at the end, are actual, ca actual cases that we had in our environment. Because, you know, there again, hypothetical, I know you've never had issues like that, uh, and we'll walk through some of that. As we go through, I'm going to stop at the end of each section to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, but, you know, this is a, a great group. I love Bry Forum just because this is the reality of, of, our, uh, of the technologies. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into the materials. So what exactly crosses the wire? With ICA, it's kind of like a mystery. It's just this stuff that goes through the network. Well, it's a lot more than that, and because if you don't have a network, you don't have a live ICA session. When I used to speak at Synergy years ago, it was iForum then, that's how I would start off my networking sessions. No network, no ICA. That's exactly what it boils down to. So it's a very critical component. What we're going to go through today is we're going to talk about the ICA protocol itself. We'll get into the virtual channels, go into the multi-streaming functionality that's new, talk about prioritization and QoS, then we'll get into the data packets, and lastly, and, and most importantly, I think to all of you, why is my Citrix session so slow? But you have to understand a lot of basics about the ICA protocol. I'm going to try to keep it fun, I'm going to try to keep it lively, but some of this stuff, networking, you know, it is what it is. All right, we'll start off with the seven-layer OSI model. ICA functions at layer six of the, sev of the uh, OSI model. That's w uh, the presentation layer. Remember we used to call it presentation server? That's why. In terms of the marketing terminology HDX, HDX is not actually the protocol. The actual protocol is ICA, and I think you're going to see more and more that Citrix is saying ICA slash HDX. I'm not quite sure exactly how they're framing it, but the actual protocol is ICA. Terms of ICA communications, what you have is it's inbound to the server, and most of what I'm going to talk about today is based on Zen App. How many of you are running Zen App? Zen Desktop? Both? Okay. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on Zen App because what I'm seeing out there is that there's a lot more of, of Zen App. Certainly a lot of this is, is exactly uh, applicable to Zen Desktop. ICA is ICA. There's uh, a few differences, but not, uh, not significant. So we're going inbound to the server or inbound to the uh, virtual desktop via 1494 and then outbound via dynamically allocated port. This gets important when we get into that discussion of QoS. How exactly do you configure that? Session reliability. It's a great feature. It's enabled by default, but what exactly is it? What you're doing is you're tunneling the ICA data through what we call CGP, the Common Gateway Protocol, and it traverses the network via 2598. So you can see, I love doing network traces. To me, that's kind of fun, and hopefully I'll get a few of you into doing that stuff too. And I apologize that this is uh, kind of difficult to see, except for those of you in the front. But you can see here on my network trace, my destination port in here is 2598. Any guesses as to what kind of uh, packet this might be? What kind of data is crossing the wire? By the end of today's session, you'll know for sure. But this is probably a printing job that's going across the wire. And that's because there are multiples of it. But you'll learn more about that in a few minutes. Okay, so session reliability is enabled by default. It's based on the Citrix XTE service. Remember in the days of presentation server 4.0, if you had to bounce XTE, or if you bounced IMA, you killed your existing sessions? Well, that was because there was a dependency there. With session reliability, so the session still stays, stays connected, and it does that for a period of three minutes by default. 
The user can't do anything with the screen. And what it's actually doing in the background is the data is being buffered so that when the connection does come back up, the user can interact with the application again. And that's great. A lot of times session reliability kicks in before your users even understand what has happened because it, the, uh, the hourglass doesn't even have a chance to appear. It just, it, it buffers that connection. It's, it's a momentary little blip on the network. All is good, refreshes, and the user never knows it. One thing that is kind of important with regard to session re reliability is it's not used by some Citrix receivers, most notably the iPad. And I'll get into a scenario towards the very end as to uh, my Citrix session, <coughs> excuse me, as to why there is a little bit of a difference with the iPad and one little configuration uh, imperfection can really make your life difficult for your iPad users. But Citrix Receiver does not use session reliability. In terms of a Keep Alive, so what is a Keep Alive? Who's seen the Verizon commercial? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. That's kind of like what happens with an ICA Keep Alive. But with session reliability invoked, it's not enabled by default, nor in general do you need it. So you don't need that keep alive because session reliability is taking care of that session. In terms of your session status, uh, there's a lot of good ways to see what is happening with your user. Uh, in the console, you can just right click the user session. We'll talk about desktop director in just a minute. In terms of receiver, ask your user to take a look at what's happening. They can look at the connection center. In the connection center, uh, you'll notice on the right where we have the receive and the send, um, that those are not necessarily always green because we don't always have a lot of data that is crossing the wire. But what you are gonna look for in here is, is would be your any type of errors, your frame errors, your percent frame errors, and so forth, in order to understand, is there something wrong with my network connection? Because again, no network, no live ICA connection. <coughs> Excuse me. Desktop director and HDX monitor, great tools to be able to get insight as to what is happening within your user session. Highly recommend that you use these. However, for those of you that are running Zen App, what versions are you running? Um, Zen App 5? Show of hands. 6? Six? 6.5? Six, okay, so it's pretty much one third, one third, one third. How about Zen Desktop? Uh, 4, anybody? 5? Five, 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 six. Okay, so again, we're pretty much across the board, so I wanna point out tools that everybody can use regardless of the version that you're using. So as we get into the discussion of, uh, of desktop director and HDX monitor, again, it varies a little bit. The most recent versions, it's a great, they're great tools to use, but if you run Zen App 5 in your environment, hmm, forget it, it's not quite gonna happen. How much bandwidth do I need for ICA? This is always the million dollar question. And I will tell you that no matter what bandwidth analysis study you take a look at, it is probably not applicable to every, to your, to your scenario. Because if it's done in a lab, you don't know how much other traffic is going across the wire. If it's done in a lab, probably little or none, unless it's set up properly with a WAN emulator to account for latency and congestion. So how much bandwidth do you need for ICA? Well, as applications get richer and users want more and more, you're going to use more bandwidth. HDX is, uh, incorporates some great technologies and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of those. But as your applications get richer, you need more bandwidth. That's just the reality of the situation. So how much bandwidth do you need? It really varies. When we get into some of the data points, you'll see how your ICA fluctuates, it goes up and down. What your users are doing, they're not always sitting there typing, they're not always sitting there creating a PowerPoint, they're doing various activities and that's going to reflect on how much bandwidth that you need. Your, your user behavior is going to affect uh, what you're doing, your applications, how graphical are your applications. Are your users using something like CAD or are they typing emails all day long? 
and you've probably got everything in between. So there's a lot of variables in terms of how much bandwidth do I need for ICA. Years ago, when I was with Citrix, we used to say use 20K as kind of a, a point of reference as to how much bandwidth that you needed. And I've seen uh, a study that was done on Zen Desktop that I believe the number came out to about, I think it was 40 or 50K per user. I'm going to beg to differ with those numbers because it's really going to vary, and I think it's going to be somewhat higher, especially if your users are spending a lot of time in front of their, uh, their virtual desktops or their virtual applications. So keep in mind, you're going to have a lot of variables, and it's probably going to increase. It's not going to decrease. So what happens when you don't have enough bandwidth? Well, your typing is slow, it's choppy, your users are not going to be happy, and your phone is going to be ringing. We don't like that at all. If this happens and it is a momentary network blip, it's going to come back very quickly, and session reliability is going to be invoked. In terms of configuring your published applications, and I'll go through and give you some tips as we go along because there's a lot of little things that you can do that can make your environment that much better. Things like better appearance versus better speed. When you're publishing your applications, choosing 16-bit versus 32-bit. Sounds like a simple thing. For example, we've got one client has a very fragile network. They insisted on the appearance and the 32-bit feature. Well, that's great, but they, don't, they have more problems than other clients that insist on, uh, that are fine with 16. So weigh out what it is that you can do and weigh out what your, your end users will support. ICA compression. Um, ICA is very highly optimized. It is a, in terms of a, a protocol. Um, is Brad in here? But anyway, did a great job writing ICA years ago, and it's still, it's, it's still going strong. So what happens with ICA is you have your ICA session, and it automatically tunes itself based on the available bandwidth. What that means is, if there's less bandwidth available, ICA compresses more, so it goes across the wire. So when you're doing testing, that the implication of that is that you don't always know how much bandwidth ICA is going to use in a real life scenario. That makes it really, really difficult for planning, because what if there is a huge update on your network that's occurring at the same time? What if somebody's doing uh, a large data upload a lot of things that can be happening on your network, so you don't always have the same amount of, uh, of bandwidth that's available. So with I, your ICA session, what you're doing is if it's a single session, it's going to stay pretty fat going through the pipe, whereas if you have multiple sessions, they're going to compress more as they're going through your pipe. Heavyweight compression is a great feature. However, your users don't always like what the, the appearance on the screen. If you can get away with using heavyweight compression, it's going to give you about 20% more uh, in terms of your compression, so that's great from a network standpoint. It does it at the expense of CPU, but for the most part, you're, uh, you've got plenty of CPU, so that's not really a problem anymore. Session sharing. What session sharing is, is it um, enables you to use multiple applications within the same user session with, for ZenApp. Session sharing is a great thing. It means that your user doesn't have to log on again, profile loaded, and so forth, and then experience some profile issues. But what happens with session sharing is your sessions have to all be configured, or your applications have to all be configured in the same way. That is, uh, in terms of, of things like display and so forth. The user then accesses the, the subsequent sessions within that same existing one, which is great it, it's, um, it, from a functionality standpoint. When you are load balancing, that's going to take preference. For example, when the user goes to log in again, the existing session will be accessed, and therefore the user doesn't need to spawn a new session. When you are configuring session sharing, as I mentioned, you have to have the same display, you have to have things like the window size that are exactly the same, otherwise your users are in multiple, uh, multiple sessions. All right, so that's the basics of ICA. I know some of that stuff is not super duper exciting, but it's things that you need to know, and as we go into the subsequent phases of this discussion, things that, um, that, that 
are fundamental. Any questions so far? Anybody? We're doing okay? Didn't put anybody to sleep yet? I figured if we start off with a seven layer OSI, we might, but I think we're doing okay. Okay, ICA virtual channels. There's 32 of them, you use about eight to 12 per session. And in terms of where they are and how to configure them, this is um, where they're located. Again, more reference material. Each of the virtual channels has what is called an ICA priority tag. This becomes important when you're looking through to determine what functionality has the highest importance. ThinWire has the highest importance. And, but one of the things that's tricky about your ICA priority tags <clears throat> excuse me, is depending on the technology and the version and so forth, the description changes. And that's really frustrating from a user standpoint because uh, you as an administrator, you, you don't know if depending on you're in the branch repeater console or you're in multi-streaming uh, configuration, do they call it high, do they call it real time, do they call it medium or interactive. The terminology changes and you just have to keep in mind there's four of them and in terms of what's gonna be the lowest and what's gonna be the highest. So virtual channel uh, priority and the drivers that go along with them. Again, a bit of an eye chart, I know, but there's typically DLLs or XEs that support each of those virtual channels. And that gets into, well, the, you'll see where that'll play out. You can customize the virtual channels, you can change the priority, there's a lot of things that you can do with it. For the most part, you probably don't wanna change that. Let me give you a case scenario. Let's just say you've got a retail environment where your user uh, has to, it's a, it, your, your customer's checking out, they have to be able to print the receipt right away. If they can't print the receipt right away, the customer's standing there and kind of an awkward moment for the retail person and the customer because they really want to both finish up the transaction. So you may be thinking, well, let me go ahead and prioritize printing. Well, that means that all of your pr printing traffic is now prioritized not just the receipts. So think through what it is that you want to do if you want to change around the priorities of some of your virtual channels because it may have an impact on other things that you're doing. You certainly don't want to lower the priority of something like thin wire, your mouse movements, your keystrokes, and so forth. You've got a bunch of virtual channels that you probably aren't using, and if that's the case, go ahead and shut them down. Things like, um, your COM ports, LPT ports, your client drives. When your users are logging on in the morning and they say it takes forever for me to log on, it might be because they're trying to map eight network drives. So that affects the user being able to log on and also if they can't transfer data around, moving data via ICA and the, the CDM virtual channel, it's gotten better over the years but it's still not the kind of thing that you want your users to always be moving uh, to, to be doing. So keep that in mind. If you don't need any of the drives, go ahead and, and disable them. You can control the bandwidth of the virtual channels. If you can do it by a percent allocation, that's usually a little bit better. You're printing virtual channel. We're gonna spend some time on this because one of the use cases also focuses on printing. You can, what your, the printer drivers that you're using greatly affect what happens on your network. For the reason being that if you have an inefficient driver, your print jobs are going to be bigger and it's going to send more data across the wire. So what you wanna do is use UPD whenever you can because that is a very efficient driver. Looking at your native drivers, some of them are not very efficient. Um, over the years, you know, PCL6 drivers, I know one of the things that we found when we have clients that have issues with printing or they say it's a print job. A lot of times it ends up boiling down to a PCL6 driver still. So you can go ahead and uh, wherever you can use UP, UPD, that makes sense for you. When you use UPD as a driver, your subsequent print jobs are also optimized because they're using that same driver. So again, if you can use that as your lowest common denominator, that's gonna be a good thing for you from both your user experience and then that boils down to what crosses the, the network. You can give it a higher priority, but again, I'm gonna say be very careful with doing that because think of the overall impact within your environment. 
your audio virtual channel. This is another one. As your users want rich audio, they want it to sound like the person is standing right next to them. There's a price that you pay for that in bandwidth. Looking at Zen Desktop, your default is 96K for Zen Desktop. That's a lot of bandwidth. Throw a few hundred users on your network or maybe a few thousand users and you have a lot of bandwidth that you're using. So think about, do you really need to do this? And again, how do I set my priority for it? Do I have the bandwidth to be able to support this? Uh, voice over IP uses 16 to 32K. Again, when you start to multiply that times the number of users that you have, you start to realize why your network is getting more congested. Webcams. I don't care how good HDX gets, and it's, it's got a lot of great functionality to it. You start incorporating webcams within your environment. You're looking at some of the numbers here, and I pulled this straight off of Citrix. Uh, outbound, or to the server 300 to 600K, and then back 800 to a full meg. You're talking about a lot of data that is crossing the network. So keep in mind what it is that you have to do versus the constraints that you may have within your network and you've got some business and technical decisions that you need to be making. Uh, in terms of looking at the virtual channel activity, I am a huge, huge fan of Edge Site. How many of you have Platinum Edition? How many of those that have Platinum are using Edge Site? All right, most of you are, and that's really great to hear. It. How many of you have installed Edge Site, but you don't really use it too much because it's like complex? Okay, so I'm glad to see a lot of folks are using EdgeSight. EdgeSight is a fantastic tool. I use EdgeSight absolutely every day because it, it, it enables me to look at potential issues and be able to get ahead of them. And then also when we actually have issues. Oh, oh did I say that? We never have issues. Uh, but your um, EdgeSight is a really, really great tool for that. The user troubleshooter. I've trained our help desk as to how to use this tool so that they can see when Mary Smith calls in what's happening in Mary Smith's session. Um, I know you can, you know, you can look at things like uh, desktop director and, and the HDX monitor, but we're not running Zen App 6.5 for all of our clients. So we have to use various tools and Edge Site is a common denominator for the various farms that we have. EdgeSite has, I believe it's 134 reports. Do I know every report that EdgeSite has and can I just tell you what each one does? No way, no how. There's a lot of data that's in there. I know that our DBA uses uh, the back end of EdgeSite, the SQL database, to pull all kinds of stuff. So a lot of data that's in there and that can be somewhat overwhelming, but fear not because we're, we're, pretty, tough. we're a pretty tough crowd here. This is one of the edge site reports is the ICA round trip time. We're going to spend more time on this later. But I just want to show you something that happened on the network one particular week. So we're looking at, and I hope everybody can see this, we're looking at the week of June 11th through June 15th, and we're seeing that on Tuesday, things really went through the roof. You think maybe the customer called because they said it's really slow? Exactly. And this will enable you to delve into the data and find out what in particular was slow that day. So I'm going to keep you in suspense for a little bit as to some of the things that we found when we get into the last session about why is my, my Citrix session so slow. But it's data like this that enables you to see what is happening on my network. If you can set up Edge Site to give you these reports via subscription, if you don't want to go in there all the time to look at it, that's great. But I, in particular, love the ICA round trip time report because it gives you this data. Perfmon counters, if you don't have Edge Site, you don't use Edge Site, Perfmon counters are kind of okay, but I would say go to Edge Site. It's just a lot easier in terms of the GUI in the front end and what you can do. Okay, any questions so far about virtual channels? All right, we're good. Nobody's asleep yet. This is good. All right. We're going to get into the fun stuff pretty soon. But you have to understand that piece in order to get to the, the other. All right, multi-streaming. Multi-streaming came out, what, almost a year ago. And what you're doing is you're taking what is at layer six of the OSI model and you're mapping it over to layer four. 
The most common reason that you're going to do this is to enable QoS in your environment. So if you take a look at what you have mapped for your virtual channels, and you're going to map it into your TCP port so that you could very specifically say, I want this type of traffic to have prioritization, that, that's why you would use multi-streaming. So multi-streaming is not for the faint of heart. You have to really get your head into it, and I'm going to walk you through how to do it. But I would say this is not the kind of thing you want to be doing Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock when all you can think about is having a good time for the weekend, because you've got to have your head fully into it in order to set it up right, or your Monday will be really miserable. All right, so there is the multi-port policy, and that's where you are going to map very specifically. Remember we talked about in those virtual channels, there were the four different groupings, and for example, printing has the lowest priority. So if we wanted to change the priority of not just printing, but everything that is in that lowest priority virtual channel, then that's how you would go ahead and map it into a TCP port, which then would map through your network via QoS. You with me so far? Hang in there if you're kind of on the fence on that one, because we'll, we'll go over that one more time. When you go to configure this, I will say that the GUI is somewhat confusing because part of it relates to the terminology and how it's set up. Another piece of this is that where it talks about the CGP default port that's up top and it sets the port priority to high, you would be thinking, okay, then that is my highest priority. Well, it's not actually because there's a very high and until you start going through and configuring the others, you won't really know that. Also, as you're configuring this, there is no good reason that I can think of why you would configure one of these ports and not all of them. Again, we have those four virtual channel groupings, thin wire being in the highest priority, and then we went down the line in terms of uh, client drive mappings, audio, and so forth, and all of the different virtual channels. So there's no good reason to configure some but not all, one and no more. This is, a, to me, this is an all or nothing, and you're gonna get yourself in trouble if you do just one or two or three. It's all or nothing. In terms of the policy priority, uh, again, the group name, keep in mind how it varies a little bit, and based on the Citrix literature that you read and when it was written and what product it's referring to might be talking about different things. So, Look at your lowest common denominator, and that is your priority, your highest being the zero, and your lowest being priority three, and what fits into it. So that goes back to that big eye chart that we had previous that showed the DLLs and what virtual channel that it mapped into. Uh, your priority name can only be used once, and CGP, as I mentioned, the default priority is high, and you can't change that one. All right, so as you're looking at the assignment of multi-ports, you might be thinking, all right, well, I'm going to use, I've got 2598 that's already in there, so I'm just going to use the numbers uh, previous and following 2598. There might be other things that are happening on your network on these ports, so check with your, if you're not the network administrator also, check with your network administrator before you set this up just to make sure that you're not creating a problem rather than solving one. Okay, Zen Desktop 5.5 uses UDP, and that's used for your voice over IP traffic for, uh, for primarily for bi-directional audio. So that's the good part. The lack of wow factor is that Access Gateway only supports tunneling UDP through TCP, and you really want to use this for remote users, so not sure how well that's going to work for you. Um, but it is there, uh, again, something that you just want to be aware of if you're configuring Zen Desktop 5.5 and you think you're using UDP and being more efficient about it. Okay, any questions so far? Live and kicking, everybody's had enough coffee. All right. All right, now we're starting to get into the cool stuff of prioritizing your ICA traffic. How do we make it so that some of your traffic is more important than something else? Think of it like a funnel. Everything can't be high priority. When your boss comes to you and says, I need these 18 things done on Tuesday morning before noon, and you think, 
I can't do all 18 of them. A few things are going to have to fall into a black hole or they'll get done later in the week. It's not going to happen today or by noon especially. So you take your to-do list and you create your, your priority of things that you realistically can do. Same thing that you're going to do across your network. If your network is congested, everything cannot be high priority. Something's got to fall through the funnel. Some things may never get done. And just like, same thing again with QoS, some of these packets we may intentionally drop on our network. So you're not creating any extra bandwidth and your, your pipe is still the same size. We're just saying something is more important than something else. There's a few different ways that we can configure ICA prioritization. You can do it at layer four, you can do it at layer six, or you can do it at layer seven. I would say that you're, most of the time you're going to be using layer four. You're going to want to take your ICA protocol, or if you're using multi-streaming, and configure it that way. A, it's easy. B, it's straightforward. It's just, it's the way to go. But again, not Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock when you're not focused on doing it right. And we'll talk through for each of these how it is that you can set them up. Whoops, sorry. Else we go forward instead of backwards. Okay, in terms of layer 4 and the things that you can do there, we talked about 1494, we talked about 2598, we talked about multi-streaming. It's pretty straightforward when you're looking at setting up QoS on your networking system. You just say, I want to prioritize this inbound into our, into our network or into our, um, our data, our, our, our Citrix environment. It's a dynamically allocated port so you're use, uh, for the outbound, so you're just using your source and destination appropriately. That's pretty straightforward, and I think that's the way you're going to go. If you're going to configure QoS, I would say, oh, at least 90% of the time. Uh, just consider that probably the right way that you'll be doing it. You can do it at layer six, but if you can configure multi-streaming and push that layer six traffic onto layer four so that you can identify it via, via TCP port, I don't know why you'd want to do layer six, unless you're using an older version of Zen App or Zen Desktop and that does not have the multi-streaming functionality. That's the only reason I could see doing that. Again, think back to that retail environment where you've got your user that's waiting for that receipt which is a print job, and maybe that you need to prioritize it. If you're on an older version of Zen App or Zen Desktop and that's why you need to do it, that might be why you do it here via layer six. Layer seven, application. I'm just going to cover this to tell you why you wouldn't want to do it. Reason being that you have to disable session sharing. So prioritizing by application is not something new. Cisco came out with that about the year 2000 for what they called NBAR, which was network-based application recognition. Essentially taking your application and saying that my, I want to prioritize via application it was a great idea. But if you lose session sharing in the process, what are you getting out of it? If you're using um, Zen Desktop or a published desktop, that's different because you don't have multiple sessions in there. But if you have, if you're using Zen App as published applications, I just don't see why you'd want to be doing this. Okay, so in terms of a QoS solution, what are you most likely to do? You're going to use probably layer four based on either multi-streaming or the TCP port itself. So I want to prioritize all of my ICA traffic. In general, that is sufficient for what you need to do. In most environments, what you're looking to do is prioritize number one is voice over IP, and then of course your Citrix traffic, especially if it's important, uh, mission critical for your organization, then, layer, then your second highest priority would be your ICA traffic, generally via layer four, and then your other traffic falls below that. You shouldn't need to go down anything uh, past layer three on here. I can't see why you would do it. There may be some very individualized circumstances why you would. Okay, that's QoS. Any questions so far on QoS? We losing anybody? All right. All right, now it starts to get cool, ICA data. So let's look at your network round trip time versus your ICA round trip time. They are not one and the same. They're different types of data that are going across the network different size packets that are going across the network. Your network data is everything. Your ICA data is a subset of it. 
So you can see here on this graphic how my ICA network round trip time is less, I'm sorry, is more than my average network round trip time. And in a lot of cases you'll see this because ICA packets are very small. Oh, a couple slides down. So what exactly is the definition of ICA round trip time? And this comes from uh, one of the Citrix documents. It's the amount of time it takes for a command in a user's session to reach the server and then the server's response to reach the client device. So in essence, going back and forth. In general, if it's under 100 milliseconds, you're in pretty good shape. Your, uh, you know, most of your LANs obviously are, are in the single digits and, and very, very low, but across a WAN link, if you're under 100, life's very good. If you get to 100 to 200, you're still in good shape. And we use, for the most part, we we're, we're look at about two, anything under 200, we're not gonna worry about it. 200 to 300, your users are gonna start complaining, especially because that is an average Keep in mind that that means there's data, there's round trip times that are higher and there's some that are lower. Those that are higher are going to be much higher from, than that 200 to 300, in which case if it's over 300, your phone is definitely ringing. We've all got better things to do than to be addressing, reacting to issues. We wanna be a whole lot more proactive where we can. So we wanna keep our, the data, our round trip times, use these rough numbers and these are Life according to Joe Harder and, and the experiences that I've had, these are the numbers that I think that you, are, you should be pretty comfortable with using. Your network traffic is not static. I know these, I apologize that these are a little hard to see, but you're gonna look for peaks and averages during business hours. Again, your network traffic is not a smooth line. It's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. Depends on what your users are doing, your Active Directory updates, it could be a gazillion other things that are crossing the wire. What you will see in general is that your ups and downs roughly correlate. And you can see this on this chart. However, one of the differences, and again, I apologize, this is kind of hard to see, but your peak over on your left side is 360, and your peak on your right side is 500. So look at your, um, your network traffic, and this is, we're looking at our sent and received per second as our data is, is crossing the wire. Again, they're roughly equivalent, but, uh, but not always exactly the same. Network line quality, how does this impact our data? Well, it impacts it in a huge way. Look at your wireless and your cell connections. How often are you on your cell phone and you say, I can't hear you, somebody on the other end? Obviously, if somebody's using a 3G or a 4G card and they're accessing the network that way, that means there's some drop packets along the line and they're gonna say, you know, this ICA stuff doesn't work. Well, how are you accessing? Oh, my 4G card. And are you, how many bars do you have? Oh, one. Excuse me. Same thing that if you're on the cell phone as to what's happening with your, uh, your ICA connection. You're gonna wanna dig in deeper on the network side because there's mysteries there that need solved. There's things that you're gonna want to know and if you truly have a network issue, you gotta delve in deep. And it's just one of those things, roll up your sleeves and start digging. You're gonna be playing detective in order to find out what's happening. On the network side, there's something called BGP that's used for routing. Any little misconfiguration in BGP, your life is miserable and you won't know it. I see a few people grinning in the audience because you've been there. All right, so your network carrier has configured BGP. Chances are you can't see that BGP configuration. They make it very difficult for you. Uh, things like your spanning tree configuration, what do they have set up on their end? You, may, you might not know it, you might not go to know to look for it. Um, jitter, you can usually get your stats on jitter. And if you use Citrix Receiver 3 or higher, that helps to, uh, to placate jitter a bit. And again, your inconsistent network speeds, especially where your network carrier is providing a best case uh, network speed versus maybe not so good. So your network carriers may not always be forthcoming with network information. 
You have to ask just the right question of just the right person or look at just the right report in order to see this type of information if you truly have a network problem. In terms of frames per second, Zen Desktop and Zen App 6.5 and uh, higher use 24 frames per, per second by default. Well, that's great. That means my, user, my, my refresh happens 24 times per second. Wonderful, my display is great. Mm, let me think about this. If I have a higher frames per second and I have a congested network, I could be in the red zone on network issues. So it's wonderful to provide that display to the users. We've got the capability to do it. You can even set it up to 30 frames per second if you want to. But if your network is in a fragile state, you're going to suffer for it. It's going to uh, then actually end up being slower for the user and for everyone involved. So think about, do you really want to do this? Your ICA packets, they are usually under 100 uh, bytes. And you can see some examples here. I think this is large enough that most everyone can see it. I have a few captures, uh, a few lines of a capture. And you can see how small my payload is for my ICA traffic. For the most part, what I'm sending over are keystrokes and mouse movements. Uh, as we start to get into more richer data with, with um, graphics and so forth, it obviously is going to go up. But a lot of times, these packets are very, very small. You have a lot of little packets as, as, that are going over the network. One of the fundamentals of networking is each packet has additional data that it needs to incorporate in there, the source, the destination, uh, a lot of other pieces of, of data that are overhead to the ICA data itself. So as we look at that, and, and I believe the number is 40, um, 40, yeah, it's 40 bytes on the packet. So as you look at that, you're adding that much more data to each individual packet. All right, so you can see how the, a lot of overhead adds up in there. But the downside of this, Oh, I'll get into that in just a minute. The, the downside of that, well, you just want to keep in mind you've got small ICA packets. And your packet size, you've got your network admin is going to take a look at the previous uh, capture and say, you know, I can take these ICA packets and I can make them so much more efficient for you because I can stuff that packet and make sure that it's got 1,500, actually 1,460 bytes of data and therefore we don't have all this overhead so we'll bring the network traffic down. Well, that sounds great from a networking perspective. From an ICA perspective, uh, make sure that your voicemail is totally empty on both your cell phone and your landline because you will have your users calling you nonstop. Your, the reason for that is if you delay the ICA data going through, it's got to go through immediately or else your users are sitting there waiting. So your network admin says, I want to stuff the packets and make them full. And you're saying, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't stuff the, the ICA packets. All right, we need those packets to be very small as they're going across the wire. So to stuff or not to stuff the packets? No, don't go there. It may seem counterintuitive, but you definitely do not want to be stuffing the packets. All right, now we're going to look at the data packets themselves. And as you may have seen in my bio, I really like to do this stuff. I know I'm kind of weird, but hey, you know, we're techies, and that's why we come to Bry Forum, because we love this stuff. All right, your average ICA packet, here's a packet, and we're looking at, um, you know, you can, you can use something very simple uh, Microsoft Network Monitor is just fine. You can get into using fancier tools. You can use Wireshark, whatever it is that you like to use. There's a lot of free tools out there. There's also some, uh, some fee-based tools that, are, that give you some additional complexity. Whatever you like to do, as long as you're dissecting packets, life is good. So what we're going to take a look at within this packet, uh, we're going to start to look at what type of packet it is so that you can understand your data stream. Now, for some of you, you'll probably never get to this point. For some of you, you're thinking, oh, this is fun. So for those of you, like, tune in. For the, those of you that need to tune out for about five minutes, I'm OK with that. All right, so before we, we dissect the packets, what you need to keep in mind is the priority that we talked about, those four different priority groupings. And 
the, um, the tags that go with it. However, keep in mind that in an SSL tag, your ICA data, or an, IC, an SSL packet, your ICA data is encapsulated, so you can't read it. That's the whole purpose of SSL. From the SSL packet on the client side, you'll notice there's no TCP payload. Again, that is all encrypted and not shown in there. All right, when you're looking at an ICA data packet, the first two bits of the second byte are priority tags, and this will make sense once I show you the graphic in just a second. Um, you'll look at many, a lot of your packets start off with a zero, zero, and that's because they're thin wire. Those are your mouse movements and your keystrokes that are going across the wire. Those are generally very small packets. What we looked at before where I showed you most of the packets were under 100 bytes, those were actually thin wire packets that were going across the wire. So use hex so we can finally have a good reason for that hex calculator. All right, in this case, uh, we've got FE there. And what we're looking at is, and I know this is kind of hard to see, so we're going to take this packet and we're looking at Remember I said the second data packet in the, pay, the second byte in the payload, in this case it's FE, FE goes back to binary, which is three in decimal. You with me so far? All right, come on, hang in there, hang in there. All right, so this is an ICA packet with a very low priority. So what we're looking at is this three, let me go back to, oops. Sorry, that light's kind of blinding. All right, so we're going back to the FE, which translated to a three, priority three, that's the lowest priority. All right, so this is a printing packet because A, it's large, it's a pretty full packet, and we can see that it's an FE, so it's that, that lowest priority. Did I lose anybody on that one? I know a few of you just said, I am tuning her out for this piece because I have no need to go there, and I'm okay with that. But for those of you that were with me on that, any questions on that? All right. Okay, let's jump into why is my Citrix session so slow? First of all, what one user defines as slow, another will say is just fine. And that's what makes this really difficult, because your users will say, it took me forever to log on this morning. Well, forever to some users is a minute. Forever to other users is five minutes because they went and got a cup of coffee and the logon was just completing. For some users, it's 30 seconds. Same thing that happens with my ongoing session. It's so slow. What exactly does that mean? Everybody wants to blame the network. Why? Because you can't see it. And it's fun to blame the network administrator. Well, if it's not you. It's fun to blame the network administrator. But I'm going to tell you to first look at things like your CPU, take a look at your storage in particular, and look at some of the other configurations. I am going to tell you about half the time it is not really a network issue. So it's easy to blame the network admin, but it might not be a network issue. However, sometimes they're intertwined. And we'll look at that. So what exactly is slow? Let's get some definition from the user. You get some tickets that get escalated from the help desk that say the user is saying it's really slow. Everything's slow. OK, Mary Smith called. It's slow again. What exactly is slow? Let's have that conversation with Mary Smith. Or maybe we get the help desk folks to tell you more information, Make, maybe create some scripts so that you have more information to work off of. And therefore, when it gets to you, it's easier to solve. Well, in this case, the user saying that their group training materials are slow to access. Hmm, client drive mapping, maybe that's an issue. But the other applications are lightning fast. So in this case, it might just be a storage issue or an internal access as opposed to something that's actually going across the wire. So ask some more questions to define what's happening. A couple little things, and I know this session is supposed to focus on networking, but a few things in particular that I have found over the years that just seem to be that needle in the haystack. CPU, single-threaded apps that hug a single processor. 
You don't see it if you just look at overall processor utilization. I see a couple of you smiling because you've been there. Um, memory, of course, do your reboots. Disks and storage. I don't know about you all, but we have a DBA, love them dearly, but when Gene is running reports, depending on where he, you know, what storage he's pulling from and, and so forth, sometimes things come to a crawl. And it's, Gene, are you pulling reports again this morning? Oh yeah, I was. All right, my storage is, is dog slow. That is the reason why. Another thing that makes it appear that your network is slow is your app data folder. Over the years, um, the, the whole discussion of folder redirection has gone back and forth. Should you redirect the folder? Should you just keep them with the profile? In terms of your app data folder, you want to consider what, it, what impact does that have and if it makes your applications appear slow. So one of the things that is kept in your app data folder is an Outlook signature. User is in Outlook on, your, on a Citrix application via Outlook. They click New Mail. It takes forever for that to come up. They say, this Citrix stuff is really slow. I go to create an email, it takes me 20 seconds for it to come up. Must be a network problem. It's not. It has to do with your app data folder and where it is being stored and if it's with the profile or if it's being redirected and if it has to then pull from that redirected location in order to get to that, um, that Outlook signature. So appears to be a network problem, but it's not. Okay, so let's go through some of the chief contributors to high ICA latency. Your network congestion and failures. I think that one's pretty straightforward, and that's the first thing that you want to always assume, or I should say the natural thing that everyone assumes. It's not always the case. Your graphics, your video, your audio. Again, these can use up a lot of your network data, and or a lot of your network bandwidth, and the richer that your environment gets, the more it's going to use. Your file transfers can bring your, your network to a grinding halt if your users are moving around a lot of files. See if there's a more efficient way for them to just keep it on your, uh, within your data, uh, data environment as opposed to moving things back and forth from their local devices. And large and unoptimized print jobs are a major culprit for your network, for your users to say, my Citrix, uh, my Citrix stuff is really slow today. Edge site is going to be your best friend. For those of you that have not yet implemented it, I hope after today you will, because you're going to see how you can use Edge site very efficiently to be able to track down what's happening in your environment. You took a look at some of the round trip reports already. I gave you a little glimpse as to how they can be used efficiently, and we're going to talk more about that. There's also a real time dashboard. When we have a particular location or some users that say it's really, really slow, I'll kick on the, the dashboard, take a look at what's happening on a real-time basis, again, because I want to look at that ICA round trip time, and this is, to me, the best and most efficient tool in order to do that. So let me get through a few use cases here. First one is every once in a while my screen freezes. Second, we're going to look at a, a branch session that has slower intermittent failures. And then we're going to take this user, Natalia, that has a printing problem and find out why is Natalia's, why are her print jobs so slow? Why is her overall ICA session time slow? And why is she experiencing some issues? And then we're going to go into iPad and why it doesn't connect to Citrix anymore. So the first one is a use case every once in a while my screen freezes. I'm sure you users say this. I was working and, you know, just every now and then I go to do something and it just seems to take a few seconds for it to kick in or maybe longer. A, it could be that session reliability is kicking in because there was a little network blip or it could be something else that's happening on the network. So when something like this happens, what I do is take a look at the edge site real-time monitoring, go ahead and enable that, and then also look at the ICA session round time round time trip report. So this is the real time monitoring. And again, I apologize that this is a little hard to read, but what I do is I set my process, within EdgeSite, you can set up a configuration. 
You go all the way to the right into configuration, and you can set up your real-time monitoring. Within there, you can set up to eight different items for your real-time monitoring reports so that this will appear, um, give you a, a red, yellow, green as to how it's doing on your network. And then below, when, you, when you're in real-time monitoring, you can just click on an individual server that maybe has some, some higher parameters. So this is how I like to set up mine, processor, CPU, and so forth, that at 80%. My disk queue, anything over two is probably not good. And looking at inactive sessions, too. So right here, not seeing anything that alarms me. Now we're going to look at the network. And these are the connections. And again, this, this is how I set up mine. I look at my failed, retransmitted, and disk queue, everything over one. My reset, I set to 10. In most cases, I would set a reset down to one. The reason I use 10 is because we have a, how do I want to say this? A process that instead of finishing off a connection cleanly, just does resets. And I know that because we've researched it and realize, and t actually 10 is probably a low number to use for this purpose, but in most environments, if you don't have anything that is specifically causing network resets, think of, think of a network reset as, remember, you know how you have some users that used to pull the plug on their computer every night before shutting down gracefully? And we had to tell them, please don't do that. Just, you know, control alt delete and sign off, or just whatever, be, be gentle. Do a graceful log off. Same thing that happens here in terms of the resets. That's, that's a good analogy for you. But look what happened right here. At about, what, 309, 310, I have my average ICA round trip time jumped to, oh, probably about 9,000. And these are in milliseconds, so that would be a nine millisecond delay. And then same thing for my peak ICA round trip time. In most cases, you are not going to see this. Your compiled reports will not show it. But you've got to have the detailed data in order to monitor it. So this might have just been a single individual circumstance that occurred. And in this case, we had a vendor-initiated process that did impact ICA. So deep, looking into it deeper, that's what I was able to find out. But this type of data is really good. I love using Edge Site for this, but when you use real-time monitoring within your environment, it does put an extra load on your servers. So keep that in mind and use it sporadically as needed, uh, but it is a great tool to have when you do need it. So one of the other things I did is I went and took a look at my overall performance that day. As I look at the data, a few things come to mind here, and, and there again, I pulled this for just that particular day, and I looked at server E. So server E has my round trip time in here as um, about 141 milliseconds for ICA. So again, that's going to play into what is happening, but if I look at 140 millisecond ICA round trip time, that's not really awful. I wouldn't have picked up on that individual blip on the network and been able to research it had I just looked at my overall network performance. A lot of that data can be hidden for the, under the guise of averages, and you won't necessarily know it. All right, so let me, oh, let me just go back up for one second. So we had a user, JS, that had, in particular, a higher round trip time. And we want to take a look at what happened with user JS's session. Well, a couple of things that are rather interesting here. Uh, on this first session ID, we can see that the user started a session and abandoned it. This will jump your numbers very high on your ICA round trip reports because the user starts to make a connection and for whatever reason doesn't actually complete the connection. But that, make, that causes your, uh, your stats to jump higher. So you actually may have another issue. Maybe it's the user profile couldn't load. You don't know that. You need to dig into that a little bit deeper. But what I'm trying to give you are the tools and the forensics that you can gather in order to, to start solving those issues. 
It's a detective work. I mean, our job titles, a lot of them should have detective in them, not necessarily engineer, architect, or whatever we call ourselves. We're, we're play detectives. All right, so that definitely played into what is happening. Whenever you go into Edge Site, into the user troubleshooter, and it tells you no data available, if it's more than three days, it always tells you that. But a lot of times, what that means is that your user started to make a connection, and for whatever reason, that connection was not successful in completing. And usually, those sessions, just like what you see on this one, uh, user logged in at 6.50 p.m., and the log off time was 6.52, usually they're about two minutes long. Just means the user couldn't complete the connection, and your stats are going to be that much higher. All right, so that's my use case one. Let's get into the bank. So we have a branch of a, of a bank that all of a sudden everything would grind to a halt, get very slow, or it would fail totally. Couldn't find a rhyme or reason as to why this happened. Sometimes we'd go a few days, sometimes we would go a few weeks without this occurring. I know you've never had intermittent problems because they're the worst to track down. Uh, but if you do, this is the type of thing that we can, uh, we can uh, go ahead and track through. So what would happen when this occurred is the user sessions would fall into a disconnect state, session reliability kicks in, and then within about 5 to 15 minutes, everything would be fine again. Couldn't figure out why is this happening. I mean, the entire branch. So if it's just one user, well, maybe it's got something to do with that user's computer. Maybe it's the user's profile. Maybe it's something specifically re related to that user. Where it's a, an entire branch or entire site location, that's where it's, it, mm, OK, probably have a network issue here. So here's where you start playing detective and try to figure out what is happening for this particular branch. This doesn't make any sense. The network vendor insisted everything was OK. Hmm, could that be a clue as to what's happening here? All right, so what we did is we put some more aggressive monitoring in place in order to track this issue down. What we showed is that there was a, a, a big spike right before everything went down. Again, not a surprise, because all of a sudden everything got congested. What ended up being the problem it was the spanning tree configuration on the network provider side. You have to ver this is like that needle in a haystack. But where I'm going with this is you've got to press, if you really believe that it is a network issue, you have to press your network provider. And in this case, we don't control that network connection to the client. And I know for some of you, you're, you, know, you don't necessarily control it because uh, your, your end users may or ne may not be part of a, your, your corporation. But we don't control that network connection, so you have to ask very explicit questions and demand very explicit reports what is happening on the network in order to trace this down. It was, a, it was very complex. This, this went on for quite a while. So the moral of the story is don't always trust Trust what your network provider tells you. We want to believe them, but chances are they're trying to do a good job. But in this case, it was just a configuration. All right, let me run through a couple of other items because we're starting to run light on time. All right, now we have Natalia. Natalia had high ICA latency. Her network latency wasn't too bad, but Natalia did a lot of printing. Look at Natalia's round trip time. This is downright ugly. Natalia probably didn't, she was one of these people saying, I hate this Citrix stuff. All right, you can see Natalia's round trip time. So what I did is I pulled this report in a couple of different ways, and I'm only showing you by user here. But I did this report once I started to tune in that Natalia was having some problems. I also found there was another user, Joseph J, that was in a similar circumstance as Natalia. And this was actually a better day for Joseph than normal. But Natalia and Joseph, OK, I was on to something. Natalia and Joseph both have an issue here. What's the commonality? What's my least common denominator for Natalia and Joseph? Did some digging, and I found out that it was related to when Natalia and Joseph logged on to a particular server, this always happened. 
didn't happen with the other servers, just happened when Natalia and Joseph logged on to uh, server, I believe it was E. Hmm, what's going on with server E? Did some digging around on server E. Now this is a 2003 server. I have an NT40 kernel driver on there. I didn't do this, this was there long before I got there. All right, but what happens? We talked before about inefficient printer drivers and what that can do to your print jobs and therefore do to your network. So there's a lot of things that are interrelated here and we can't always say we have a network problem. The previous one with the, brand, the bank branch, that was truly, absolutely, positively a network problem. This was a little bit of both, but really that was the core problem. Okay, so will the universal print server help? That was released about two weeks ago. We did install it in our dev environment. I like what I see. What I don't like about universal print server is that there's a 50 print stream limitation. To me, that means I can't, I can't use it in my environment. So I think that as UPS continues on, I think we'll see that improve. But for right now, depending on how large your environment is, that may mean that it's, it's probably not feasible for you. Uh, it does use also the UPD driver. You can set it up to use Windows native driver, but the hope was we could use UPD for this. But there, it's basically just your printing, not your additional multifunction, uh, your, your multifunction printer functionality and so forth. So, mm, not sure if that's going to work. All right, use case, my iPad connectivity is broken. A lot of your users out there have iPads. They love using uh, Citrix via their iPads. Life is good. Worked fine yesterday. Made a change in Netscaler and added something to the STA list. Now, Netscaler saying all my STAs are up, life is good. I don't understand why my users can't connect. That's the only thing I changed since yesterday. Mm, whoops. So what's wrong with this uh, CTX STA config? See that UID for the STA? It ends in a lowercase letter. You would think, I don't care about lowercase, up, uppercase. It's an, an STA is an STA. Eh, wrong answer. A lowercase STA will cause your iPad connections to fail. Learn this one the hard way. So for, I don't know how many of you touch Netscaler as well, but something to keep in mind. I see a few of you like jotting this down because your, your users can't connect via an iPad. All right. Okay, so you need, uh, so let's start to wrap up here. You need Edge Site to track down Citrix networking issues. If in doubt, reread the title. You need Edge Site to track down Citrix networking issues. It's the best tool for looking at your ICA networking uh, data. A couple of Edge Site tips. Again, not really related to network, but let me talk about the PVS setup. How many of you are using, trying to use Edge Site with PVS and it won't spit out good data? Anybody? All right, well, maybe we were the only ones that ever encountered this. But on your V-Disk, what you need to do is stop your uh, Citrix system monitoring agent. You have to delete these two files, the Edge Site any and the rsdater.fdb, your fi uh, Firebird database. Do not restart them. If you restart them, Edge Site starts to report in. And what happens with your Edge Site data is it looks at everything that's deployed via that V-Disk and it thinks they're all the same, so it only starts pulling data from one of them. All right, maybe we were unique with that one. Okay, in terms of your edge site reports, when you start to look at your, um, when you go into the browse uh, per, uh, tab in edge site, and you go to pull any reports, any reports for that day are not complete. It's great for looking at forensics, or you want to force a run worker update in order to see what has happened up to the minute. But if you're looking for up to the minute data, you want to use real time. If you're looking to pull reports, your, your boss comes in and says, what happened with the network this morning? Da, 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 da. And if you go to pull an edge site report, you will not have it there based on the default uploads. Okay, so in summary, ICA, pretty cool data. A lot of cool things that we can do with it. We can prioritize it. We can set it up via multi-streaming. 
maybe a few of you are going to start dissecting packets after today. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, use edge site. And last thing, last thought I want to leave you with is although edge site technology, uh, HDX technologies go a long way in minimizing the impact of your end user experience, it throws a lot more traffic across the wire. So um, I think we might have, do we even have any time left? I have like one minute. <laughs> Was this helpful? Any, any, any questions so far? Anybody? Question? Not explicitly. Um, no, I haven't. Doesn't mean that it won't exist, though. Never say never with networking. OK. Well, thank you all for attending uh, Bry Forum and this session. Hope this was helpful to you.